Thank you, Ted. Well, good afternoon. All right. Well, I wanted to uh, share with you a um, presentation entitled, What is Optimal Health? Uh, complexity Science, Chaos Theory, and Its Impact on Ancestral Health. Can everyone hear me? Good. All right. My disclaimer is that these comments and statements in no way reflect my employer. Uh, so that is my disclaimer <laughs> as a practicing MD, and I think the other MDs in the audience can relate. Um, but just a little bit of background about me. I'm a um, heart surgeon, and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I take care of some very fit people and have the uh, opportunity to help them and uh, get better. And I, this is kind of a typical day of taking someone who's uh, either in the emergency room or in the intensive care unit, very sick, has a lot of medical problems, taking the operating room, uh, doing some uh, heart surgery and fixing them up, and then watching them get better. So, so the intuitive question is why me and why am I here? Um, I, uh, over the last several years, have um, really gravitated toward uh, the ancestral uh, uh, health program and, and, and information, and I really found it helpful. And so last year, I uh, took the opportunity to present and talk a little bit about the, the tough road that physicians have in that there are uh, medical guidelines that we have that recommend certain ways to uh, recommend advice to our patients. And then there's this emerging data that we're all experiencing here at this type of conference that is uh, fascinating and wonderful and excellent, uh, but hasn't quite made it to the clinic yet. And so I talked a little bit about how inflammation has been a uh, important driver of atherosclerosis, uh, and how the inflammatory uh, markers and, and, pro and, and proteins in the cells are very similar to the atherosclerotic uh, proteins in the cells, and there, there's probably a, a crossover there, and how the ancestral diet uh, does decrease biomarkers for inflammation, uh, and uh, that could and probably will and does uh, decrease and, de and deflect the uh, heart disease. Uh, risk uh, to a much lower state. This year I wanted to change and use a different topic or tackle a different topic. And this is a kind of a big question is what is optimal health? Because if you go to different groups or different physicians or different people and ask them what does it mean to be healthy or optimally healthy, you're going to get different answers. So for example, if you go to a um, conference of uh, vegans, for example, and ask them what optimal health is, um, their answer and their road, uh, road path to that is going to be different than going to a different uh, type of, uh, of group. And so the other question is, if we have optimal health, how do we know it when we see it? Is it possible to even quantify or measure truly optimal health? Uh, how do we measure it and how do we achieve it? So those, those, those are some of the questions that I'm going to address today. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about an ancestral health program or ancestral health diet, uh, there's three components that really make up the ancestral health uh, uh, program, then I think that everyone in this room uh, will would appreciate. There may be different variations and various, various different takes, but it does involve three things, a uh, change in diet, uh, exercise or movement, uh, sleep or relaxation. And so I think all those three components are necessary uh, to really have a successful um, and ancestral health uh, program. And you could see here that obviously there are a lot of different variables that go into um, optimizing each of those individual categories. So the question is, inherently, what does ancestral health have to do with chaos theory? And likewise, what does chaos theory have to do with ancestral health? Well, I hope by the end of this talk that you'll uh, agree with me that there is a very important contributor to the ancestral health program uh, from chaos theory. Well, we all think of chaos in many different ways, and, and sometimes we think of chaos as a bad thing, but uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, we'll end up thinking of chaos as actually a good thing. Uh, it was really introduced into the, uh, uh, the vernacular, so to speak, in 1988 uh, with this book about uh, uh, the first introduction to chaos theory. And uh, some quotes from that are that alongside relativity, re relativity and quantum mechanics, it is being hailed as a 20th century third, uh, third revolution. And we got introduced to this concept that sounds a little bit fanciful, but it actually is somewhat relevant. It's called the butterfly effect. This, this effect grants the power to cause a hurricane in China to a but butterfly flapping its, its wings in New Mexico. That sounds uh, somewhat fanciful, but it's not. It actually uh, is compliant with the chaos theory uh, and many th things that we'll talk about today. 
So the, the intent behind the butterfly effect is that small changes in initial conditions can lead to a drastic result depending on the starting conditions. And for this uh, talk and, and preparation for this lecture, I really uh, had um, some inspiration from these really wonderful, I think, uh, excellent books. So first one is Where Medicine Went Wrong by Bruce West, and I'll talk a little bit about that and use some of the references. And Complexity in Medicine, The Elephant in the Waiting Room. If anyone has any more interest in this, I really encourage you to look up these resources and references. They are fantastic. They're well written. They're easy to understand. But they really address uh, a situation that uh, not a lot of people are talking about. As we've heard this morning, uh, Art Devaney uh, has uh, been um, a proponent of this. And I also uh, drew inspiration and, and information from the New Evolution Diet. And obviously, our, in the theme with our uh, speaker this morning, I also uh, used him as an inspiration, although I've got a little bit of a different take on it than, than he does. So as we get into this material, I want to begin with the foundational principles. The foundational principles were pretty much laid out by uh, Stephen Jay Gould in this book called Full House. And in, in that book, his whole thesis was that the human mind has a trusty device for simplifying a complex world. We reduce to averages and identify trends. So we take all this complexity and we try to make it simple. And sometimes we fool ourselves. But that's in our inherent nature. And uh, Stephen Jay Gould also said, our culture encodes a strong bias either to neglect or ignore variation. We tend to focus instead on measures of central tendency. And as a result, we make some terrible mistakes, often with considerable practical import. So really, that quote about ignoring variation is really important. Because chaos theory and complexity science is all about variation. And many of you have heard or seen or know about fractals. Well, fractals are very inter interesting. They're iterative patterns of nesting sequences with self-similarity. So if you could you know, basically, within this um, fractal here, any point in the fractal is similar to the larger uh, nature of the fractal. And that's kind of the, the, the definition of fractal. But the human body is actually one big fractal. Uh, and there's something called fractal anatomy. If you look at all the blood vessels in the body and the way that they branch and divide and change size uh, all throughout the body, that is truly a fractal pattern. Likewise, if you can pick any other organ system in the body, the brain, the liver, the kidney, everything in the body uh, organizes, organizes itself in a fractal anatomy pattern. And to me, that's a big clue or tip-off that there's something going on that, that is in connection with this fractal situation. And so I want to spend a couple of minutes here talking about heart rate. And this is where I think some really important information has been done, and I think there's a lot more work to be done in this, in this area. So I want to talk about this article briefly called Heart Rate Variability in Aids and Athletes. And so I want to introduce this concept of heart rate variability. So when we come in to, and see a patient in the clinic, we get an EKG. The EKG prints out a, a page of heart rate, heart rhythm, and we look at the rhythm of the heart. And on there it says, normal sinus rhythm, atrial fibrillation, it tells you the rhythm, and you look at it, and everything is spaced out pretty regularly in normal sinus rhythm. But if you could actually drill down and look at the actual rate of the heart rate, even the chaotic pattern of the heart rate. So I think it's really unnerving some, at some level to think that your heart beating at what you perceive as a heart, as a normal rate is actually beating at a chaotically irregular rate. And so we call this a healthy complexity. So this complexity to the heart rate actually is the state of affairs and is a state of health and is a measure of health. And in fact, when you see, see how this heart rate can change, the heart rate variability, it can break down in two different ways. The first is that the heart rate can, heart rate variability can actually decrease. So think about that. You've got decreased heart rate variability and that is a marker or sign of illness or health or, or disease. The other way that heart rate variability can break down is it can become completely chaotic, have no organized structure whatsoever, and have complete wild uh, fluctuation. And that's another breakdown uh, in a sign of illness or disease. And this study that I referenced uh, earlier here is talking about heart rate variability in, in, in athletes or in trained individuals is very interesting because this table shows that it compares people that have been trained with aerobic uh, activities versus untrained individuals or control groups. 
And you could see that the people that had, that participated in exercise and were trained individuals had greater heart rate variability than those that were in the control group. So this is an indicator that uh, exercise and, and movement and, and fitness is actually a driver of increased heart rate variability in a good way. So in fact, when we're doing exercises and, and training, we're actually training the heart rate and training the nervous system to be more irregular. Another interesting fact about the heart rate variability is that there is a natural decline of the heart rate variability with aging. So there is a loss of chaos uh, with aging to the heart rate variability as we age. So an older individual inherently has a more organized or less chaotic uh, heart rate variability than someone who's younger. And that raises the question, think about all those people out there with pacemakers in the medical device industry. Those pacemakers are sending out constant electrical impulses to the heart. So perhaps we need to be thinking about reprogramming those pacemakers or redesigning those pacemakers to actually have some degree of chaotic variability or else we're actually training the heart to become diseased by sending out a constant pulse. Just food for thought. Well, this is really interesting, but, but is this something that's super specialized? Well, no. This is actually can be done uh, by anyone, uh, non-professional people. There are actually... Uh, devices and applications out there that are non-medical uh, affiliated that you can get to actually measure your heart rate variability. And uh, I don't have any ownership or interest in any of these, so I'm not, I'm not promoting anything. I'm just sharing that, uh, for example, you can actually plug in a uh, on your heart rate monitor strap and you can plug in with your app and you can actually every day assess your own heart rate variability. And uh, you need a baseline about two weeks of information. So you take your heart rate and readings every day at the same time, the same conditions, and you have your baseline. And then every morning that you get up or whatever time you choose to do it, you actually measure your heart rate variability. And you can assess, is this a good day for my heart rate variability or a bad day for my heart rate variability? And you can tell based off of that perhaps how you might change things in your lifestyle that day uh, to compensate or address that change or decompensation in the variability. Here's another one called BioForce HRV, heart rate variability. So there are a number of commercial products available for the quantified self movement, so to speak. And I encourage uh, anyone who has an interest in this to try this. And uh, there's a lot of people out there, you know, doing the experiments of N of 1 out there. And I think it would be interesting to really uh, do some more work with this and get some experience. So I don't want to get too far off the track, but futuristically, uh, the potential exists to remotely monitor uh, um, soldiers or military in the field by wearing special monitors to monitor their heart rate variability. And that could be an early sign that they're in stress, that they're in trouble, or that they have sustained an injury that not yet has been detected. And so it, it, this is a way that will be um, implemented with a heart rate variability. And for any of you who know Eric Topol, he's been very prominent in talking about these smart band-aids, and they are literally EKG monitors that you can wear on your uh, skin with just a, a piece of uh, adhesive tape, and through these monitors, you can actually monitor heart rate. And so I think as we begin to quantify and find ways to measure the heart rate, we're going to be um, studying uh, heart rate variability in, in greater detail. So we've talked a little bit about heart rate variability and exercise. And in fact, I will say that professional athletes are using this and teams are using this to assess training uh, of their athletes. And so they will every day have their athletes assessed for heart rate variability. And if their heart rate variability has changed, they will change their training program to make sure that they're not overtrained. And uh, this is something that's really being implemented, uh, but we have a long way to go. Long way to go. This is not something that's in the clinic. It's not something that your uh, your physician, cardiologist, or specialist would actually use in the clinic. It's actually starting to get some traction outside of the clinic, and, uh, and we'll work its way in. But what about diet? Can diet affect heart rate variability? So that's the next question. And the answer is yes. And here's a paper that did a review article looking at omega-3 fatty acid supplementation and heart rate variability. And uh, in this paper, uh, they uh, proposed that the, uh, the theory or the sequence is that omega-3 fatty acids may modulate the automatic control uh, uh, of the heart, autonomic control of the heart. And we know that omega-3 fatty acids are abundant in the brain and nervous tissue as well as in cardiac tissue. 
And studies have demonstrated a positive association between cellular content of omega-3 fatty acids and heart rate variability. And supplementation with heart, omega-3 fatty acids seems to increase heart rate variability. And remember, it's what we're looking to increase the heart rate variability. You do not want decreased heart rate variability. That is a sign of illness and disease. And so we actually want to increase that. So by actually adding a particular dietary element, we can actually improve and increase the heart rate variability, which is a sign of health. And so this could be a possible explanation for a decreased risk of arrhythmic events and sudden cardiac death, which is sometimes observed after omega-3 fatty acid supplementation. So yes, diet can affect heart rate variability. So we've talked about exercise, diet. What about sleep? Could sleep affect heart rate variability? Or could heart rate variability affect sleep? Which came first, huh? And so this, uh, there are a number of different articles. They're all small studies, so they're, we're not talking about huge uh, aggregate studies. We're talking about studies that say that, uh, for example, this one, the subjective sleep quality and heart rate variability in human dialysis patients. And we did show that the quality of the sleep that the individuals had the night before did affect the heart rate variability the next day. And that was the only, that was a controlled variable study. Uh, everything else kept the same. Here's another study. Reduced heart rate variability predicts poor sleep quality in a case control study of chronic fatigue syndrome. So this is the other side of the coin. So you've got decreased heart rate variability predicting that that night the individual is going to have a poor night's sleep because their heart rate variability has declined, which is a marker of disease. So it could actually predict a lot of things. It's pretty interesting. And then finally, this is a little bit larger study, a heart rate variability, sleep, and sleep disorders, once again showing that the the quality of the health, uh, quality of the sleep can affect uh, the health of the individual. So heart rate variability has, I think, a lot of interest, a lot of uh, potential for helping us understand what is optimal health and healthfully giving us uh, feedback on um, determining and living a optimally healthy lifestyle. And this is part of the anticipatory medicine uh, movement where a signal complexity can affect health, and likewise health can affect uh, signal complexity. And this is not just about heart rate variability. This can look at, you can look at other, many other ways of ordering and measuring health, such as uh, sleep apnea, breathing patterns. Breathing patterns inherently are also chaotic, have the same breathing pattern variability that heart rate variability has. Likewise, brain waves are inherently chaotic in a macroscopic way. Also, gait patterns, measuring the patterns in which somebody walks um, is uh, an indicator of chaos, as well as chaos is reflected in the gait pattern. And the, uh, the person that has discovered and really uh, championed the uh, heart rate variability said, we're developing and refining computational tools to pull the useful information out of extremely complex data, data sets. So I think this is kind of the future where we're going. So we've shown that, that ancestral health does have a component of chaos theory, and chaos theory may be one of the underlying components of um, our underlying health and physiology. And as I said uh, about this fractal idea, we talked about fractal anatomy. Every organ system in the body is organizing itself in a fractal manner. We have all of our organ physiology, uh, fractal breathing, fractal gait, fractal temperature, fractal neurons. All of them architecturally are fractal, and all of them are um, organized in a fractal pattern. So uh, I'll start to wrap this up, uh, but I want to start to finish up with this uh, idea of a fractal gut. Um, if you look at the way that the small bowel uh, is organized in the in the body, uh, you can see that it, it has a kind of a chaotic but rhythmic pattern to it. Um, and you can see that uh, histologically, the, the villi in the small intestine are also organized in a fractal pattern, very similar to the macro uh, pattern of the uh, small intestine. And when you look at uh, someone who is gluten sensitive or sensitive to the effects of gluten or celiac disease, you can see they actually have a breakdown of this fractal pattern. You can see macroscopically, you can see that the actual uh, villi are dampened over here compared to a normal normal healthy villi. So once again, it's a demonstration of loss of fractal, loss of chaos, loss of variability as a way of showing disease or representing disease. So I, I'm really interested and excited to explore that with you, and I think we're out of time, so I will wrap that up so we have questions, but I hope that we can explore this in, in depth in the, in the future. Thank you very much. Right. Uh,
thank you, Grayson. We have, we're running a little bit behind time, so we'll have a few questions, but let's make them quick. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, a couple of things you mentioned, the postural issues, the sleep hygiene issues. I just wanted to mention that all in HRV disruptions shows up in very early childhood, under the age of five, and it's flying way under the radar of most physicians. Um, so it's just a comment. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's just another example of how important I think it will be. Yes, could you speak to, um, I'm aware of heart rate variability and the work of the Institute of Heart Math and variability as it deals with stress and the smoothness of that. Could you say a few words about that in relationship, if you if you could? Absolutely. Um, that's another component. So as we talked about, we have exercise or movement, we have diet, we have sleep. But uh, within the sleep or relaxation mode, uh, we do have the heart mass program and the heart rate variability associated with stress and and uh, mindfulness and, and meditation. And uh, those are just manifestations of disruptions of the autonomic nervous system when you've got stress. And it's another way that we need to can help control or monitor the heart rate variability. Uh, but it's not just about taking stress out of your life. And it, it, it can be the other factors as well, exercise, diet, and sleep. So, it's, so a lot of people think if, uh, if, that the, if they take out the stress, then everything else is going to be okay. But I'm trying to show, obviously, that, that, that it takes a lot more than that. But a good point about the uh, mindfulness as well. Thank you. Uh, as you showed that uh, decreased HRV is associated with a disease state, but uh, do we know for a fact that it's necessarily good to increase HRV in a seemingly otherwise healthy person? Like, could there be some limit at which it becomes detrimental? Yes. Um, so that's where the overtraining aspect is. That's a great question. So um, there obviously is a threshold or limit to which uh, you want to get the uh, HRV uh, to. Um, but it, it really becomes uh, a baseline individual interdependence. So that's where the professional athletes will um, check out um, um, their heart rate variability every day. And so it's there to be overtrained. So yes, you don't want to push yourself or train too much, and then you have too much heart rate variability, and then you've got a problem. So absolutely, that's something that's uh, a concern. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask about entropy. So you say that the HRV decreases as people age. So is that just a function of increased entropy, or is there something else going on that is actually just a normal biological process that is, like what in the aging process is causing that? Is it an increased entropy? Is it essentially a decrease in total energy, like whatever that is defined as biologically? That's a great question, and we don't know the answer to that. At least the answer is not in the literature, and that's obviously an area that we need to do a lot more research on. Um, but we do know that we, you know, we can see somebody when they're ill, uh, they have uh, loss of heart rate variability. So, they, so that illness, you know, for that individual, is not necessarily a loss of their total energy. It's just that it's a marker of their illness. So, by that natural entropy over time with the aging process, we think that that that. The, the chaos is necessary for health, and that by losing the chaos over time is a sign of the manifestation of the multi, um, you know, complex uh, things of aging. Okay, we're going to wrap up and move on because we're running a little bit late. Thank you. Thank you.